I remember about the massacre through my grandmother. She always talked about it as if it happened yesterday. When you think about the history of the United States, there are a few key dates that really made a difference, where the way events were before really shifted. And one of those dates was in 1637, the English and their Indian allies attacked a fort at Mystic, Connecticut. The massacre at Mystic Fort did change relationships between the colonists and the Indians forever. It set the form for the taking of Indian land and the process is repeated across the country. The massacre at Mystic was the first time English people engaged in the wholesale slaughter of Native Americans, but it certainly would not be the last. May 26, 1637 was a day that changed everything in the land that would become America. Between 1620 and 1640, 20,000 people left England in something that's become known as the Great Migration and came to New England. It was a chance to start a new life in a new world. For most of them, there was an intensely spiritual element to the journey as well. Imagine if you had left everyone you knew sold everything you had and shipped off to a place that you really didn't know and you felt impelled to do this by your religious principles. What would you do when you got there? The English who come to Plymouth Colony or to Boston are very convinced that they have a direct line to the truth. Their goal is to create a religious set of communities in New England and purify the Christian church. And for that reason, they get the nickname Puritans. These British true believers who come to New England are not expecting to find Indians. Or if they think there might be some people there, they're not particularly concerned about how to deal with them. Nevertheless, there were numerous tribes in North America, cultures as old and proud as any in Europe. One of the most respected and feared was called the Pequot. The Pequots were the most powerful group of native peoples in southern New England at the time that European settlers arrived. They were the most numerous, they were the wealthiest, they were the most politically powerful. Highly organized and aggressive, the Pequots had a gift for trade and expansion. They dominated nearby tribes, using threats and alliances to control the land and trade over hundreds of square miles in what is now eastern Connecticut. Land that included some of the most fertile in the region. The first encounter between Europeans and Indians was positive because our people followed a way of life that was based on sharing. And that was the essence of our belief system. During the early years, trade allows for an accommodation between worlds. As long as the common understanding is through trade, you're going to have relative neighborliness. Each had something the other wanted. The Pequots wanted European trade goods, kettles, cloth, axes, hoes. The English, on their part, wanted furs and wampum. Wampum are shell beads made from conch shells and from the quahog shell. I'm wearing wampum right now. It's a necklace that's very popular among Indian people today as jewelry. But it was once the most sacred item that we, as Indian people, could exchange. Wampum was something we gave at marriages. Wampum was something we gave if we wanted a treaty. The English and Dutch and French needed wampum to trade for furs with interior native people. Because the Pequot controlled so much of the coastline, they also controlled the wampum. 
to the European colonists, the Pequot became a sort of mint, churning out shell currency that fueled all the other trade in the region. How that sacred item became referenced as money is something that shows how little intercultural understanding there was between Indian and non-Indian people. The English are convinced that their way of believing is the only correct way. And they're also convinced that the Indians simply haven't heard the right way. They haven't been taught the right way. The English didn't really think the native people had any religion. They didn't see any native churches. There was no architecture. What the Europeans really didn't understand is that native perception of the world was fundamentally different than theirs. The native spirituality was one in which supernatural power was pervasive in the world. And it was something which one could access directly through trance, through the use of tobacco, through dreams. From the point of view of the English, anyone who sought power through access to the spiritual world were, in fact, um, communing with the devil. The Puritans found the Indians shocking, not only in terms of their worship, but also in their relationships with one another. They were shocked by the native dress or lack of dress. They were shocked by the relationships between men and women. Women were treated as equals. They were able to speak forcefully and often did. They were themselves traders and leaders. Women also were the main producers of food. Something like 80% of the food consumed by Native American peoples were produced by the labor of women. Most of the time, Indian men were out in the forest. When they came back, they were generally at rest. It was easy for the English to get the idea that Indian men were lazy and didn't do much of anything, and that Indian women did all the hard work. The English were scandalized because that was the exact opposite of how the English society was organized. The Indians, for their part, thought that the English babied their wives, and they would complain sometimes about how the English men shouldn't be working in the field and doing women's work. These two cultures are so differently organized that they are just going to go on a collision course towards each other. As the Puritans and natives grew increasingly distrustful of each other, there was another danger, disease, unintentionally carried to the New World by the European colonists. When the Europeans arrived, they brought with them a host of diseases that native people had no immunity to at all. Measles, smallpox, chickenpox, yellow fever, typhus. When these diseases were introduced, they had a devastating impact. In fact, the place that the Puritans chose to settle had formerly been an Indian village, but all of the Indians there had died. And the reason the Puritans settled there was the fields had been previously cleared so they could move in and get started planting right away. This the Puritans took as a sign that God was preparing a place for them in this new world. They saw it as being providential. For the native people, it was also providential, but in a very terrible way. What does it mean? when your entire family is lying on mats covered with sores, dying. It's an awful moment. And 
It happened over and over again in New England. 75 to 90 percent of the coastal population of Native peoples along New England were uh, destroyed in these epidemics. By 1634, the Pequot population went from an estimated 13,000 to fewer than 4,000. Nevertheless, compared to tribes that had lost 90 percent or even 100 percent of their members, the Pequots and their rivals, the Narragansetts and Mohegans, were less affected by disease. Because the Pequots and the Narragansetts were less heavily affected, they were additionally powerful. The most important effects in the short term for the Pequots and the Narragansetts was the instability in tribal relations that it created. The epidemics along the south shore of New England shuffled the deck and they opened the possibilities of power grabs up to anybody who was skillful enough to play. The Pequot, the Mohegan, and the Narragansett are all jockeying for connections to various different groups of Europeans. And tensions emerge as these different native groups and groups of European struggle to gain control over the flow of goods moving through New England. As the native populations weakened through disease and intertribal conflicts, the English began to feel that the New World was a place that they might not need to share. 